Welcome to part two of my definitely scientifically accurate list of games that made the Amiga great. You can find part one linked in the description below, and part three might be there too if you're watching this after I've put that one live. Haha, <laughs> living in this technological nightmare is fun. This second instalment of the games that made the Amiga great is pretty much the same as last time, except with different games. You might see ones you love missing, you might think I'm wrong, you might think they were better on the snares or Mega Drive or PC or whatever, but well, it's still my list, so suck it, nerds. So, again, for what it's worth, for what they mean to me, for how they changed my life, these are the second 10 of the 31 games that made the Amiga great. The Chaos Engine. Node activated. Pretty much the only reason the Chaos Engine is in this list. That's a complete lie, actually. While the game you might know as Soldiers of Fortune, if you bought the inferior non-Amiga console versions, does have some of the greatest sound effects and music ever committed to three and a half inch floppy, ooh -er, it's definitely not the sole reason this Bitmap Brothers classic gets to be in the list. Taking ideas from Gauntlet before throwing down the Gauntlet and running the Gauntlet, the Chaos Engine is one of the purest examples of all elements of design coming together to make a glorious whole. As mentioned, it sounds great, it looks brilliant, it's riddled with great ideas like how you're always in a two-man team in a merry little cooperative yet competitive dance, and it plays superbly, offering the kind of challenge that makes us all cry with fury these days for being too hard, but what in actual fact is just, well, too hard. Really, it is, I've never finished the Chaos Engine without a cheat. But it's the experience, the thick atmosphere it drags you into, the camaraderie it forces on you if playing with another person before pulling the rug from under you in a moment of special power, stealing underhanded bastardry. The Chaos Engine stands out from the pack as something truly unique, a very Amiga game, and one that had the rare pleasure of being ported to and enjoyed on the big consoles of the day. Shame about that daft name change though, and switching the preacher to a scientist was just silly. Your side note here is, of course, the Chaos Engine 2, a game I'm sure would be much more fondly remembered and would have had a gigantic impact on the Amiga were it not for the fact it released in 1996. By that point, you could not find a single person in the world who cared about or owned an Amiga, let alone someone with a friend who could play the sequel with them. It's sad, sure, but it is scientific fact. Lionheart. I harp on about it a fair bit here, but the rivalry between the Amiga and consoles of the early 90s was important. It felt like Commodore's machine had to constantly prove itself over and again that it was capable of pumping out hits on a par with the fashionable games machines for those console kids. Disclaimer, I owned and loved both the SNES and the Mega Drive, this is nothing personal. And so games like Lionheart released. A side-scrolling platformer in the vein of oh so many for those other consoles, it upped the ante with gorgeous graphics, parallax scrolling and 3D effects, and the sort of depth of play you might not expect from a usually rather straightforward genre. Also, you play as a Catman from another planet, which is always welcome. What makes Lionheart extra pertinent here is its background. See, its creators were Thalion Software, a demo scene group turned dev team which pushed itself to make technologically impressive titles for the Amiga, just as a point of pride. You might have seen this a bit on the PC at the time, but really it wasn't an approach, an entry point to the industry that popped up many places other than on the Amiga. As such, Lionheart was very much an Amiga-only great. I will admit I was torn between Lionheart and that other action platformer on the Amiga Switchblade 2, or maybe even Zool at a push, the ninja of the nth dimension indeed. But while both these titles stand out and have their positives, in fact Switchblade is genuinely good fun, I went for the Catman simulator. It's the better game, and it stands strong to this day. Frontier Elite 2 There has to be an Elite, doesn't there? But okay, I will admit this one was a toss-up as to whether it belongs on the list of Amiga greats or not, seeing as though it's more closely associated with the PC than Commodore's machine. And it certainly ran a lot better on the PC than it did on my A500. Though bless that big ugly lump, it certainly tried. And I gave it more than enough chances to try. God, I played a lot of Frontier. And yet, how many other games on the Amiga have a whole universe in them? How many give you the freedom to do just what you want to do and get lost, stranded even, in the middle of absolute nowhere, that let you live out your dreams of being a space trucker? None. Frontier is a mixed bag performance-wise, an empty shell for those who want a driven narrative experience, and totally unlike anything else on the Amiga. 
Except for the original Elite, obviously. That's something a fair bit like Elite 2 for some unknown reason. And Frontier was, yet again, a call to arms for Amiga owners, showing the wider world that this now six-year-old machine, if you're looking at the A500 in 1993, was still capable of putting up a fight and outperforming those other whippersnappers on the block, just so long as they weren't on the PC. It gave us hope and it gave me an excuse to spend countless hours just pootling along in space making a space nuisance of myself. Should I talk now about how I had the star map as included with the original Amiga release up on the wall in our games room, and that I had trade routes memorised, including the one to Samis with its Amiga and Atari ST only bug that made precious metals and gemstones illegal in the system, meaning you were literally paid to take them away, and that I never understood the process of triangulation to successfully use the 655 light year wormholes, and that I never got above dangerous in the elite rankings even when I tried to cheat by shooting a rock for ages, and that, yeah, I've played Frontier a lot. Swiv. If I could include something on this list solely because of its explosion sound effects, I would include Swiv. I might just pretend that's the reason it's here now anyway, even though it's not. That sort of subterfuge might put people off loving everything I produce though, and we all know being loved is all that matters in the world of mighty YouTube influencers like me. Hmm. Anyway, Swiv. Why does it matter? Why does it stand out? Well, it's an arcade perfect game based on no arcade game. It's an exciting, challenging shooter with a fun two-player twist, one of you's a jeep, the other an attack chopper, popping up on the Amiga in 1991, when everything fast-paced and shooty-bang was arcade or console-based. Swiv's another one of those that showed up and, well, showed up the competition. I mean, it's hard and it's not exactly depth central, but it's replayable and stands up to 20, um, seven years of scrutiny. Wow, mortality is a fun concept. Were it not for Swiv coming along when it did, would the Amiga have ended up where it did in the grand gaming scheme of things? Probably yes. But it did come along, so it did have impact, so I can include it in the list of Amiga's true greats, which is nice. Special mention here goes to Siltworm, of which Swiv is a sequel of sorts. While each game has its pros and cons, and an argument could be made for either bagging a spot in this mighty list, I'm going with Swiv just because it was initially made for the Amiga and other home computers, while Siltworm was an arcade game. Face the facts. Cannon fodder. There's literally no way I can talk about Cannon Fodder ever without quoting its famous tagline we all know and love. This is a game on Ian's list. Ah, what a line. Memorable, snappy, oft-repeated, but never bettered. Cannon Fodder is one of the Amiga's top five games of all times, to me, and it's battling for the top spot in my mind as the game that made the machine. Obviously it was ported all over the place, you might even know it better for its appearances on other formats, you damn Luddite, but without the Amiga there'd be no Cannon Fodder. It was the perfect storm, direct control via mouse, sound hardware capable of making that music. And the cries of agony as a troop does indeed lay dying in the sun. A style of play bridging the gap between strategy and action, it could only have been made for the Amiga. There's a lot that can be said about Cannon Fodder's arrival on the scene back in 1993, and a lot was said back then. In short, the game was meant to feature a poppy on the front cover, a potent symbol of war remembrance in the UK, and a tabloid newspaper went ballistic at this fact, as did a few politicians and commenters of the day, claiming it to be disrespectful and a callous misuse of charitable iconography. It was the best marketing campaign any game could have hoped for, and everyone ended up buying the game. Thanks, newspapers! What helps Cannon Fodder stand up to both the criticisms of the past and our more cynical, jaded viewpoints of the future, present, whenever it is we live, is the fact that, well, for one, it's an incredible game, and two, it actually makes a surprisingly potent anti-war statement. For all Call of Duty's yammering on about being respectful and honouring the troops and whatever else, that's just lip service for games in which you kill hundreds of people for little actual reason. At least Cannon Fodder has the balls to put it right there in front of you. These are the men who died, this is how many have been killed. As you get ready for your next mission, you'll sit there and you'll look at a hill littered with the headstones of every soldier who's died under your command. War is futile. I mean, that's what I took away from it as a ten-year-old, but then I've always been a cynical beast, so maybe I was way off. I'd say special mention to Cannon Fodder 2 here, but the alien levels were a bit pump and it suffered from wild difficulty swings for seemingly no reason. Even as a child I saw it should have been a mission pack, not a full sequel, but A, it was still fun, B, the original had more than enough impact on its own, and C, it's still a million times better than Cannon Fodder 3, which was awful. Moonstone. 
I'm sure there are a fair few smiles being cracked at the mere mention of this one. Search your memories for what this was like, what it was all about, and, well, it's not quite what your brain remembers. What Moonstone is, is a mix of turn-based and straight action RPG full of knights, hairy beast things, gold and dragons for up to four players. It's unique for its time and has some great ideas riddling it, but it's not an all-time mega highly rated classic. See, Moonstone stands out as an Amiga great in a different way to a lot of the other games on this list. It didn't review spectacularly well on release in 1991, with publications calling out its lack of variety and silly difficulty against the AI. And honestly, with my reviewer's beret on, it is rather a shallow experience. But that didn't matter to us when we were younger. Moonstone is different. Moonstone let us play with three friends, and Moonstone is violent. Chasing a chum around the map with the sole intention of lopping the head off is something that sticks with you. Every games machine has its cult classics, and Moonstone is very much that for the Amiga. Somewhat overlooked in its day, though notorious at the same time, it's become pretty much loved in the intervening years, to the point where as soon as the Amiga is mentioned, Moonstone is brought up, usually with that big grin I mentioned being cracked before on the face of whoever's talking. It took a while, but eventually Moonstone became a true Amiga great. Stunt Car Racer the sound effects from Stunt Car Racer are burned into my mind. The high-pitched whine of the engine as your wheels leave the track, the intensity of the acceleration using turbo, the screams of frustration as I once again come off the track and end up losing the race. This is a game that showed off what the Amiga was all about, impressive technology imagination and being bloody good fun to play. And hard. Always hard. Stunt Car Racer was and is brilliant, and I am shocked to this day there's never been a remake with only a single aborted attempt rearing its head over the last 30 years. Where other races are about either accuracy to the real world or a different gimmick away from the racing itself, Stunt Car Racer sticks to being about the racing, it sticks to the realistic physics, and it sticks to the challenge that comes with being a simulation style of game. It just all takes place on tracks that resemble quite literally roller coasters, as well as having no way of stopping you from falling off the side. It's utterly unique in the world of gaming and has always been a brilliant standout title for the Amiga. I'd harp on about how you can play Stunt Car Racer basically via LAN, or no modem cable if you're a nerd from the past like me, and how cool that was, but for one, that wasn't something unique to the Amiga or the game, and two, when I was a kid I totally misunderstood the link-up play method, and thought if I was playing the game at the same time as a friend in a different place with no cabling or modems or anything linking them together at all, I would be able to play against them, so it's not something I want to dwell on. Regardless of my idiocy, Stunt Car Racer remains a favourite to this day. It's still exhilarating, still an impressive technical feat, and it's still really bloody hard and I don't think I'll ever get promoted to the first division. I could very easily have included Jeff Crammon's other game here, but, and here's something sure to make some whiny comments appear, I can't stand Formula One. Sure, F1 Grand Prix on the Amiga might have been a technological tour de force and the sort of thing you excitedly squeaked about to your parents as they feigned interest while engaging in divorce proceedings, but I'm picking Stunt Car Racer as the one that made the machine from Crammon. Wings. Battlefield Who? seems to experience a gripping emotional story based in the First World War, one has to shuffle back to 1990 and not suffer through EA's dead-in-the-eyes modern FPS. Who knew? Wings is always up there in the best of lists with Amiga games, and with good reason. A mix of three styles of biplane bound play, an ongoing, responsive narrative, and a genuine sense of progression all comes together to make a delicious Great War pie. You take part in three main elements, dogfighting, bombing runs and strafing, and they're all well thought out and fun in their own right. Dogfighting is obviously the main draw, but I never did love anything quite as much as the bombing runs, where you're given a target ahead of the mission and have to remember exactly what said target is so you don't end up blowing up a hospital full of orphan puppies. And the story, sure, we're not talking the Last of Us levels of gut-wrenching despair even in a Great War setting, but Wings shows a maturity of spirit that you just didn't get in most other games. I'll always remember being pretty promoted above my commanding officer and how he actually reacted to this fact with a snide little comment. It helped to make the fantasy something more complete in my mind, taking Wings from being just another wartime combat game to something genuinely special. It's odd to say a First World War game was so ahead of its time, but the cinematic action genre was given a massive push forwards thanks to this Amiga gem. Rainbow Islands I still hear the music. It dances around in there twisting my thoughts and turning my tea-making routine into a literal song and dance. 
Somewhere over the rainbow via an 80s arcade game pushed through the delightful sound chip of the Amiga is something I have never and will never forget. It's literally going through my head right now as I say this. Rainbow Islands was an arcade game first and foremost, but its foray into the world of Amiga is an exercise in truly great home conversions. Why is an arcade port so important for the Amiga? Well, apart from the fact it's an arcade game with some depth, two golds for each level, that being with or without gems, upgradable abilities, that massive spider git from the first level, it's also an arcade game on a home computer in an era when we were moving ever more towards consoles like the NES and Master System and even the Mega Drive. Rainbow Islands isn't just fun, it shows just how good the Amiga can be with the right devs behind it. Admittedly, that didn't work out too well with Commodore ultimately imploding and the machine becoming a laughingstock in its twilight years, but what can you do? I would be remiss at the very least, strung up and beaten to death at most, were I to chat about Rainbow Islands and neglect to mention the original Bubble Bobble, the superb follow-up Parasol Stars, or even the similar but actually nothing to do with this series Rodland. So there, that's those games mentioned. I still love them all dearly, but it was Rainbow Islands that set the bar, climbed across it, then jumped on it to bring it crashing down on the monsters below so it could get a rainbow-coloured gem. And god, that music. And that's the list. There's definitely nothing I've forgotten or left out, and there will be nobody around who has any problem with any glaring, obvious titles I've left at Hired Guns. Hired Guns is the last one in this list. I was lampooning you. Hired Guns. Okay, it's hard not to have Hired Guns in a list of games that made the Amiga. Another from DMA Design, those of Lemmings, Walker and Grand Theft Auto fame, Hired Guns plays out like a sci-fi dungeon master except with the ability to play with three other people. Admittedly, back in 1993 this was subpar owing to our tiny televisions from the past and its split-screen nature. Still, don't underestimate how bloody cool a four-at-once game is, even if I did mostly have to play it by myself. And that's fine, I don't need friends, I'm happy with my Amiga, that's all I need in life. Anyway, Hired Guns is an intelligent, deep game that shows some early steps towards your modern classics like Skyrim and Divinity Original Sin. Its depth of systems never fails to impress, don't forget to protect your gun underwater or it'll rust and break, and frankly, shooting your friend by accident and it devolving into a friendly fire shootout is a memory I'll never not be fond of. Hopefully Rockstar North's next game will be Hired Guns 2. And that, friends, is part two of the list of Amiga games. Point your internet browsers in the direction of this channel for the third and final part when it goes live where I have my last chance of including every single Amiga game you ever loved, or facing instant massive punishment via the medium of comments. Just never forget how bloody great the Amiga was. Thanks for watching, please do like, share, subscribe, go searching for an Amiga in a skip, get a tetanus shot, play cannon fodder for 23 hours, stop weeping that I didn't put fire and ice in this part of the list, and get motivated in life. Oh, and I now have a Patreon, which you can find the link to in the blurb below. If you like this video and the others I've done, and you've got a bit of spare change, consider chipping in. If you can't or don't want to, that's also fine, I'm still fond of you. I'd like to offer my heartiest thanks to the following peeps for their $5 or more support on Patreon. Without you, I'd be dead, which I should stop saying as it's patently untrue. And of course a huge thanks to the higher tier contributors who helped me to afford beans and soup. Video Brains or Jake Tucker. Robbie Sabo, Lola Osman. Even if you're not mentioned, you're good people, and a top pooch. Thank you for your continued support, it helps stave off these unending headaches, though the Migrelieve also helps. Bye!